so to, this, um, this session is the influences on decision making in vaccine hesitant parents and pregnant women by Susan E. Smith. Sue Smith is a registered nurse midwife with over 30 years experience. Most recently, Susan has been employed as a maternal child health nurse working with child and family health in the country south region of Adelaide. In this position, Sue established an immunisation clinic in the Murray Mallee region, where her role was to coordinate and immunise clients ranging from six weeks of age to five years. Sue was also responsible for coordinating staff immunisation programs, as well as managing vaccine orders and cold chain maintenance. Sue has completed a Master's of Midwifery by coursework and research in 2019 with a publication of Women and Birth Journal entitled Midwife's Role in the Promotion and Provision of Antenatal Influenza Immunisation. In 2020, prior to the outbreak of COVID-19, Susan commenced a full-time PhD at Flinders University. Her project is entitled Vaccine Decision Making in Pregnancy and Parents of Children Aged 0 to 5 Years. The aim of this project is to explore the values, beliefs and choices made by pregnant women and parents regarding their decision not to vaccinate their children age of zero to five years and to determine factors that influence their decision making and to give a voice to vaccine hesitant parents. I will now hand it over to Sue Smith. Well, thanks, Bill. And first of all, I do have to apologise. My dog keeps snoring and that's not me falling asleep. So thanks for the introduction. Yes, I am a registered nurse and midwife and a maternal child health nurse. Uh, but most importantly, I am a passionate immuniser. So I'm in the final stages of completing a PhD at Flinders University in South Australia. So today it's my absolute pleasure to present the results of a recently published study, which was conducted as part of a larger body of my doctoral research. Most importantly, though, I'm a mother and a grandmother who believes passionately in preventing illness and supporting health and well-being in women and children. So as I said, the findings that I'm presenting today are from an exploratory online survey conducted via Qualtrics, which was published earlier this year. The paper uh, that was published is entitled Weighing Up the Risks, Vaccine Decision-Making in Pregnancy and Parenting. So the aim of this study was to explore the values, beliefs, and choices made by pregnant women and parents regarding their decision not to accept immunisation, to determine the factors that influence this decision making, and to give a voice to vaccine hesitant parents. So the objectives of this research were to explore when vaccine hesitant parents and pregnant women make immunisation decisions, to discover from whom and when vaccine hesitant pregnant women and parents obtain the bulk of their immunisation information and education, to explore the factors that influence those choices uh, that the vaccine hesitant parents and pregnant women make, and also finally to gain an understanding of the experiences of vaccine hesitant parents and pregnant women. So immunisation is universally accepted as one of the most significant public health initiatives in recent times. Childhood vaccines alone have been credited with saving two to three million lives annually. However, vaccine hesitancy is a growing problem in middle to high income countries like Australia and has recently overtaken vaccine access as the primary barrier to immunisation uptake. Vaccine hesitancy has been described as the reluctance or refusal to vaccinate despite the availability of vaccines. This problem was included in the top 10 threats to global health by the World Health Organization in 2019. Australia currently has high levels of childhood vaccine uptake with the national average for five-year-old uh, children sitting at around the 95% mark. However, this figure does conceal areas of low, herd uh, low vaccine hesitancy uh, which affects herd immunity and can result in the resurgence of uh, diseases and has done in recent years. But up to 50% of parents and pregnant women have reported some degree of vaccine hesitancy. So immunisation in Australia is not mandated. However, the no jab, no pay and the no jab, no play legislation, which were introduced in 2016 and 2017 respectively, um, 
they are, act as a financial incentive to encourage families to immunise children. While successful, this legislation has created considerable anger amongst vaccine hesitant families and had a greater impact on families from lower socioeconomic countries and areas. So vaccine hesitancy remains evident in all areas of immunisation, including pregnancy immunisation, which continues to reflect suboptimal intake in Australia. Pregnancy has been shown to be a time of high information needs, and it's an ideal time to provide immunisation information. It's also a time when vaccine decision making uh, commences. There are currently three vaccines recommended for pregnant women in Australia, and these include the Bordetella pertussis or whooping cough vaccine, influenza vaccine, and COVID-19 was added to the recommendations for pregnant women in June 20, uh, 2021. So the risks associated with acquiring COVID-19 in pregnancy became more evident and widely known in mid to late 2021. Pregnancy already places women at increased risk of morbidity and mortality from vaccine preventable diseases. And whilst, these are limited, uh, whilst there are limited studies on the impact of COVID-19 in pregnancy, the virus is thought to exacerbate these risks. However, antenatal immunisation uptake remains suboptimal, as I previously said, with evidence to suggest that less than 50% of pregnant women are fully immunised uh, in South Australia. Unfortunately, no data is currently available on the uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine. So the larger body of research from which these findings were drawn included three main points of data collection. These included the exploratory online survey using both open and closed uh, questions, semi-structured interviews with uh, parents and pregnant women, and a netnographic study. The latter two studies are currently under peer review and awaiting publication. So the recruitment for all three phases uh, of these um, studies previously mentioned was undertaken via this purpose designed Facebook page. Page also provided a, a, a link to the uh, survey, as you can see here, as well as a chat function um, for the netnographic data. A predominantly qualitative exploratory online survey was conducted um, on vaccine hesitant parents and pregnant women. 106 um, used the online survey via Qualtrics. This methodology was chosen um, as vaccine hesitant parents have shown a preference for an online environment where they can choose to participate or not in an environment that's relatively uh, risk-free and somewhat free of criticism. This survey included a combination of closed and open-ended questions. Convenience sampling was used to recruit pregnant women and parents who identified as vaccine hesitant. Uh, so all parents and pregnant women who were pro-immunisation were excluded from this study. The survey was promoted via uh, a paid advertisements over the course of six months um, on the Facebook page, which you've previously seen. So prior to dissemination, the survey was piloted on 29 uh, vaccine hesitant parents and pregnant women just to access, uh, assess um, readability and usability. The survey dissemination began in June 2021 and remained live until June 2020. June 21. The chat function remained live until December 21, collecting data for the netnographic study, which I hope will be available to all soon. So the survey included 30 questions with a combination of demographic information and questions seeking attitudes to immunisation, information sources, influences and opinions on COVID-19. The dissemination of this Facebook page was not limited geographically. However, participants were predominantly uh, from across Australia, 
with two participants uh, from the United States of America. Quantitative analysis was conducted on the demographic data using SPSS version 25. And qualitative data uh, were analysed manually using um, inductive thematic analysis following the guidelines of Braun and Clark. So the quantitative aspect of this study compared the incidence of vaccine hesitancy with the CIFA or the Socioeconomic Index for Area Scores according to Australian postcodes using an, an, an I can't say this, an analysis of variance or ANOVA. <laughs> Data were obtained from uh, 106 participants, however, only 104 were included uh, in this aspect of the study as they were from Australia. Only those who stated that they were not in favour of immunisation or were undecided were included in this aspect of the study. So of the total 104 participants, 70% self-reported that they and their child were unimmunised, whilst 30% were partially immunised. This was based on a personal assessment of their overall immunisation status and not specific to any individual vaccine. Gender was not a prerequisite for participation in this survey, nor was it asked as opinions were valued from both mothers and fathers. 15% of the participants identified as being pregnant with age, um, ages ranging from 18 to 50, with the majority in the 30 to 39 year old um, age group. And children range from zero to five years with the majority in uh, three plus years. So analysis, uh, sorry, uh, the analysis was compared um, compared the levels of vaccine hesitancy with the CIFA score, as I previously said. And whilst uh, the results were not significant, they did demonstrate a trend for vaccine hesitant parents and pregnant women to reside in areas of, socio of lower, sorry, higher socioeconomic status. So the three main themes which were identified by thematic analysis as the most influential in refusing vaccines included vaccine safety concerns, legal concerns, as well as the effects of a previous negative immunisation experience. 94% of participants expressed concerns about vaccine safety and those concerns included vaccine contents uh, and the safety of the industry in general. However, they didn't differentiate between vaccines or vitamins, such as Kanakian or vitamin K, um, which demonstrated a lack of understanding and knowledge in this area. Concern was also raised uh, about the new mRNA or messenger RNA vaccines, such as COVID-19. This is a new vaccine and more information should be provided to parents about the benefits uh, of this, particularly in pregnancy. These factors, combined with considerable distrust of the pharmaceutical industry, resulted in high levels of anxiety, which negatively impacted their immunisation decision making. A further area of concern raised by parents was the lack of information provided by healthcare professionals, which affected their ability to give informed consent. Other legal concerns were raised by participants including the belief that the no jab, no pay legislation was coercive in nature and legislation um, which has acted to isolate and marginalise parents and pregnant women and has affected them both financially and socially. Participants also raised concerns about the lack of vaccine injury compensation scheme in Australia. This was a factor identified by many participants as an influential factor in refusing vaccines. These factors, combined with a general distrust in the pharmaceutical industry and its practices, resulted, as I said, in high levels of anxiety amongst participants and negatively impacted their immunisation decision making. Evidence also suggested that a previous negative immunisation experience uh, could adversely affect future decision making. Participants were asked whether they or someone they knew had a negative experience during or after um, an immunisation, which may have affected their decision to reject vaccination. 
a surprisingly large number, 90% in fact, stated that they did have uh, a previous negative experience and only 10% had not experienced this. The use of alternative therapies was also evident in this survey. Uh, and whilst not considered to be a direct cause of vaccine hesitancy, was associated with a lifestyle choice which participants believed supported wellbeing and immunity. So qualitative results obtained in this research indicated that participants held a variety of personal immunisation beliefs. However, most felt that they had the right to choose whether to immunise or not, which of course they can in Australia. Some participants felt that the vaccines were riskier than the diseases they protected against, whilst one participant stated quite correctly that all vaccines should be considered dangerous medical interventions. When dealing with otherwise entirely healthy members of the population, there must be trans transparency about the risks and benefits. It should not be a one size fits all, nor should vaccination be dismissed as safe and effective without due attention given to the reality of side effects. So several participants believe that insufficient information was provided to parents and pregnant women to make informed a choice. The findings of this research suggest that the no jab, no pay legislation introduced by the Australian government had the greater effect on people of lower to middle socioeconomic status. The legislation was described by some participants as taking advantage of lower socioeconomic families uh, and a coerced choice. The no jab, no pay legislation uh, excludes families of unimmunised or underimmunised children from some financial benefits but also excludes children from access to preschool education in Australia. For some families, this legislation means a loss of a substantial second income for a minimum of five years or until a child is old enough to commence school. Whilst other participants in this research immunise only enough to continue to receive financial support. So participants were asked to identify the sources of immunisation information which they used to, to support their decision making. These sources uh, included uh, friends and family, the internet, social media, scientific evidence such as PubMed, as well as books and websites by anti-vaccination advocates like uh, Robert Kennedy Jr, as well as traditional sources. One participant stated that she'd read the entire hand side of Andrew Wakefield's fraud case. Now, Andrew Wakefield was the discredited doctor who fraudulently linked measles vaccine with autism. This information suggests that we should not, as immunisers, assume that vaccine hesitant parents are uninformed. However, the sources of information may or may not be credible sources. So vaccine decision making was influenced by many factors, including the source of immunisation information, which included the use of alternative practices to support health and wellbeing. Many participants reported that the use of alternative practices, often referred to as a salutogenic parenting, um, were used, uh, included therapies such as alternative therapies, lifestyle factors, dietary factors and supplements as well as public health factors such as fresh air, exercise and avoiding crowds. Homeoprophylaxis or the use of diluted preparations um, generally provided by a homeopath to provide infectious diseases was also mentioned uh, as a source of information uh, and support by some participants, as was the use of long-term breastfeeding. Participants who did not use these sources of information or methods of support for their uh, immune system uh, stated that they only could not do it because of financial reasons.
So participants were asked uh, who were the most trusted sources of immunisation information and general practitioners, nurses and midwives uh, made up 65% of that source of information, whilst less than 16% of participants cited obstetricians as an information source. This is despite 21% uh, of women receiving pregnancy care from an obstetrician in 2017 in South Australia. So it could be argued that only those women who elect a shared care or midwifery model of care will have access to these important sources. Additionally, women who elect an obstetric model of care could arguably remain underinformed. Nurses and mid midwives, as well as general practitioners, are trusted sources of information, as, as I said, making up 65% of the information sources. However, there's a clear need for an enhanced syllabus to support nurse and midwifery undergraduate immunisation education across Australian universities, including in areas of vaccine hesitancy and motivational counselling. There's also a need for a reminder to be placed in pregnancy handbooks to remind healthcare professionals to discuss both pregnancy and childhood immunisation at the first pregnancy visit. So participants in this study expressed a desire for balanced information and several uh, had notable quotes. One saying, I've always been open to getting information from both sides and weighing up the risks. Whilst another said, I didn't want to rely on just one source, but a personal experience with a family history of adverse reactions is hard to ignore. So based on the importance of providing accurate and credible immunisation information to pregnant women, participants were asked whether they had received information on childhood immunisation in pregnancy. While 65% had received advice, a whopping 35% had not. This lack of information at this critical time of decision making can result in information seeking from non-traditional and less credible sources such as the internet and social media. So participants were also asked to provide their understanding of the risks versus benefits of vaccines. A surprising 91% believed that vaccines were a greater risk to an infant than the diseases they protected against. This demonstrated a lack of knowledge and understanding which should have been provided by healthcare professionals as a priority early in the decision-making process. So in conclusion, this study has uh, confirmed that over 70% of participants began immunisation decision-making in pregnancy. This is clearly the optimal time to provide information about both pregnancy and childhood immunisation. This study has also shown that many vaccine hesitant parents and pregnant women are from areas of middle to high income. Hence, immunisation promotion activities should also be focused in these areas. So whose job is it? Of those who did receive advice, nurses and midwives are among the most trusted source of immunisation information in pregnancy. Along with GPs, midwives and nurses play a significant role in the provision of antenatal immunisations. However, nurses, midwives and GPs have demonstrated a lack of knowledge in dealing with vaccine hesitant parents. Additionally, nurses and midwives have reported feeling inadequately prepared for their role. Evidence has also shown that midwives currently receive minimal undergraduate immunisation education, on average less than four hours of immunisation education in a three-year degree, with many reporting inadequate preparation for this role. This must be improved to adequately prepare new graduates for their important role and 
changes are already happening at Flinders University where immunisation has been included in the midwifery syllabus. 35% of participants reported receiving no immunisation information in pregnancy. Pregnancy has been shown to be a time of high information needs and a critical time for vaccine decision making. Therefore, it is vital that parents and pregnant women have the opportunity to discuss both pregnancy and childhood immunisations early in pregnancy. Concerns over vaccine safety have been shown to have a major influence on vaccine uptake. And this is an area that needs support with accurate and timely information in pregnancy, along with assistance to work through the risks and benefits debate. This study has also revealed that a previous negative immunisation experience influenced vaccine decision making. It's become clear that adverse events, even minor ones, must not be overlooked or understated as they are potentially influential in future immunisation choices. Finally, the role of midwives in the promotion and provision of immunisation, both antenatally in the first week of a child's life, cannot be understated. Educators must include immunisation and motivational counselling in the syllabus for all midwives to adequately prepare them for this vital role. So recommendations from this research include uh, the development of an enhanced syllabus to support nurse and midwifery undergraduates um, in immunisation across Australian universities. A reminder must be included in all pregnancy handbooks to discuss both pregnancy and childhood immunisation in early pregnancy when information seeking is at its height and decision making is beginning. Additionally, the inclusion of pregnancy as a reason for immunisation in the Australian Immunisation Register would be ideal. Uh, the Australian Immunisation Register is an all of life register in Australia, um, which records individual immunisations. It currently has the capacity to record Aboriginal status as a reason for immunisation, but does not have the capacity to record pregnancy status as a reason for immunisation. Inclusion of immunisation status in all pregnancy outcome statistics should um, occur. This is the only way we can provide accurate data on perinatal outcomes and the association with the vaccine status. Additionally, midwives must discuss the importance of childhood immunisation in the first days of a child's life. Many participants in the study reported being confronted by the nature of the first vaccine which is in Australia is the hepatitis B vaccine given in the first week of life. With inadequate education, large numbers of families are likely to refuse this vaccine. And sadly, many midwives are unaware of the rationale behind the timing of it. And finally, immunisation education and promotion must be universal, but should also include families from middle to high income countries. And I can see there are some questions there. Bill, did you want to? Being finished. Uh, just I've got my um, publications. Publication to be coming up. They're there. Not there. References not there. That's okay. It doesn't matter. Not important. Oh, they were there. <laughs> There's my references. There we go. And uh, go ahead. So I thank haven't seen the earlier questions, but I can see some later ones. Yeah, thank you. So I think like I would love to dive a bit deeper into your data. I imagine there'd be other people the same, knowing a bit more about the cohort and a bit more about specific aspects of them and what we can do. So it does definitely sort of indicate that we do need to incorporate a bit more into the antenatal period. Um, sorry, I can hardly hear you. Could you speak up? Ah, can you hear me now? Yeah, sorry, it's raining yep. here, so I'm not, <laughs> not uh, getting a good connection. It, it does sound that we do need to look and add a bit more focus in the antenatal period about a bit more than what we're currently doing. Yes. Um, but we do have some questions. So yes. Gemma, so Gemma sort of says that it is likely that new maternal vaccines will become available in the near future, for example, RSV. Correct. As a midwife and immunization provider, what are some of the challenges that you see? And secondly, how can we better prepare the profession and 
and parents for maternal vaccine in the future? Well, that's a very good question. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'll have a go at it. <laughs> Thank you, Gemma. A <laughs> very insightful question. Um, yes, there will be new vaccines. And I think um, the only way to prepare parents is to prepare uh, providers. And um, unfortunately, our education has been pretty shoddy up until now. Uh, and I think once we are better educated, we'll be able to explain the rationale behind these vaccines better. And um, then we can pass on that those gems of wisdom to uh, wisdom to mothers and uh, and fathers in pregnancy. Are there any specific points that you think would be good to include in the education program for midwives? Well, I think, uh, yeah, uh, there's some wonderful courses available in South Australia, and I presume they're available um, nationally and internationally, which includes every aspect of immunisation from cold chain management through to immunisation provision and the rationale for inclusion of vaccines and the times for the inclusion. So I would like, in, in a perfect world, I would like to see all midwives having access to that course or courses like those in the undergraduate area. I don't think that will happen, uh, but um, I think they will be available post in a postgraduate environment. I think in Australia, and I don't know if it's Australia or, or just in our state, there that we have access to a certain amount of funding for our professional development. Um, and I think it would be lovely if midwives could prioritise immunisation knowledge because it's an area of knowledge that will cross all spheres of midwifery practice from antenatal to postnatal to labour and delivery. And my particular area which is uh, community and um, postnatal so it's really important that we uh, are all informed uh, all the time. Yeah you mentioned that you don't think we'll end up in antenatal education soon for midwives is there any specific barriers in the way that you've uh, discovered? I, I think time the amount of time I think certainly at Flinders they've been looking um at um, increasing the year, like adding another year to the um, midwifery course to fit everything in. And at the moment, it's a low priority. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, like I know there's educators and researchers listening, so it would be interesting if anyone has any sort of comments in this in, to throw in mm. the chat box about what they're currently doing in their midwifery programs. Is it a three-year undergraduate degree? Is it a four-year? Um, at what point do you think could it could actually be good to introduce it? So would it be a second-year topic? And where would the postgraduate midwives in Australia fit into that? Yes, very good question. Wow. I will, um, we can move on to Emily's got a question as well. So we can move on mm -hmm. to the next question. Um, yeah. But people are welcome to throw those answers into the chat box. Um, do you think there can be received some conflict, conflict felt by some midwives between women-centred and individualised care and providing vaccine recommendations? I believe there already are some conflicts in this area, but I think we must uh, look to the bigger picture and recognise that without the correct information, pregnant women and um, new, like immediately postnatal women aren't informed to make an, um, an educated choice and they're basing a lot of their decisions on information they glean from uh, the internet and social media, which is highly emotive um, and highly critical of uh, some immunisation aspects. For example, the COVID, uh, of all the participants in my study, 100% were going to refuse a COVID vaccine. Now, that's based on emotion rather than knowledge. So, um, yeah, it's okay to be women-centred and provide individualised care if you're also providing accurate education, in my mind. Yeah. Definitely. I can speak from a moment of personal experience where other people are sort of adding to the chat box is we do know that one of the, like, the leading things that help people to make a choice around vaccines is care providers making those, discussing it with them and making their recommendations. So right. there is a bit of work happening around decision aids, which people have been, I believe people have been finding helpful. So I know I use the COVID-19 one a lot. So um, I had a group of six women in my antenatal uh, group, antenatal care at some point during last year, I think it was. And initially all six were planning on declining the COVID-19 vaccine, just because of fear. And we all understand the reasons around it. They're quite individual on that. Um, at, at the end, it was sort of only one of them declined it. So five of them, after having a couple of weeks of different education and individualizing care to each woman, they um, five of them actually just changed their mind and got the vaccination. 
that's why it does. It does. Like, so there are things becoming, there are becoming more available. So there is decision aids and COSI and that sort of thing to help us provide the information to the women. We probably do need a bit more time and probably a bit more midwives in this space. So if anyone out there is interested in joining the research world, come along. Yes, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I totally agree. Cool. Does anyone else have any other questions? I have one from one PhD, one PhD candidate to another, Susan. Yes. What What was your most interesting part of this PhD study for you? Oh, challenging my my personal beliefs about people who refuse vaccines. Um, that was just so confronting. You know, as a as a long term immunizer and and a passionate immunizer at that, meeting uh, uh, people who have uh, vaccine hesitancy was a real learning curve for me and I found yeah you know what they are normal people with normal fears and anxieties and they're just getting the wrong information and and I think it was that aspect of of my um, studies that that really woke me up and said you know what it, the fault is not theirs it's ours because a recommendation from a healthcare professional is a predictor in the uptake of vaccination. There's nothing more certain than that. And if we can't communicate the correct information, the problem is ours. I think at one point, particularly the COVID-19 vaccine was because it was so new, it wasn't so much the wrong information, it was just there was so much different information. Correct, yeah. Yeah. Correct. No worries. Yeah. So we are sort of getting to the end. Sue, is there anything else you want to mention? Uh, no, I think that's all good. Unless there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer questions. So Cecilia's got vaccine hesitancy and those not taking vaccine was a large issue in Canada. So even with the best information, many preferred to wait to get COVID or co wait to get COVID or the vaccine? The vaccine, I guess. Well, potentially not. Maybe not. Wait. Oh, there's some wonderful, no COVID, um, yeah. Oh, there's some wonderful immunizer, uh, immunization uh, researchers in Canada. Eve Dubay is one of them. She's extremely well published. She does some wonderful work in this space. Yep. So they wanted to get natural immunity, which is so, great. Yeah, so, long as, so long as you survive the process, and that's sort of a, an individual decision that everyone has to make. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks. But in pregnancy, it's a little more concerning. <laughs>